the topic is the parts connections and functions of basal ganglia please note that i am dividing the topic basal ganglia topic in three different sections in today's section i will be dealing with the parts connections functions of basal ganglia and in the next lecture i will be talking about the physiological basis of various basal ganglia disorders then on the third topic i will talk about various manifestations of basal ganglia the clinical manifestations of basal ganglia and their physiological um, correlates okay uh, let us start the parts connections and functions of basal ganglia this uh, here is the brain or telencephalon you have in this brain a tadpole a tadpole like structure you have this tadpole here and uh, uh, this is the basal ganglia these are the uh, subcortical gray matters buried within the hemisphere within each hemisphere so that means uh, they are there a tadpole like structures and uh, and they are called basal ganglia or also they are known as a basal nuclei they are in fact they are connected in series with the premotor cortex thalamus motor cortex and then the motor neurons like that i am making the four things the premotor cortex the basal ganglia thalamus motor cortex and the motor neurons so all these are connected in series that's one part so these things start from the premotor cortex in the frontal lobe and they modulate the thalamic outputs here the term ganglion is a, a sort of a misnomer usually we have uh, we have used ganglion paravertebral uh, chain of ganglion uh, for the uh, autonomic nervous system especially the uh, sympathetic nervous system there is a synapse synapse is there so now in case of a dorsal root ganglion where there is a cell body of the uh, neuron so this is uh, here these are a uh, clusters of neurons inside the central nervous system the term ganglion is not usually used for clusters of neurons inside the central nervous system it's not used inside the nervous system and here we are using it as an exception now what are the parts of the basal ganglia here i have taken the the frontal section or the uh, coronal uh, coronal section coronal section of the uh, brain and if you take the coronal section of the brain these are the two lateral ventricle and we have the five parts the basal ganglia have five parts one the caudate nucleus so this is the caudate nucleus here i have made the putamen this is number two is putamen then three is globus pallidus this these two are globus pallidus and here you see this is internal this is external this is a gpe globus pallidus externa and this globus pallidus interna then we have a subthalamic nucleus so that is the cluster of neurons uh, here in the subthalamic component subthalamic nuclei substantia nigra uh, this is substantia nigra a black body so these are the five main structures of the basal ganglia in fact as i was mentioning about the basal ganglia it's a tadpole like structure 
and this tadpole like structure extends from amygdala of the uh, amygdaloid body uh, of the limbic system uh, to the this becomes the caudate head here this is a caudate head and now this caudate head uh, is uh, supporting this uh, putamen putamen and uh, within the putamen within the two putamen we have a telomeric connections uh, inside uh, interior to this thing because this is a exterior position interior to this thing is a globus pallidus so if you are looking at that and uh, this is the component this is a caudate nucleus this is thalamus there this is thalamus there and this is the the globus uh, uh, pallidus and uh, uh, putamen putamen here this is putamen there and this is globus pallidus now sometimes what happens in in the different uh, coronal sections uh, the tail of the caudate nucleus also appear this this component suppose if i am taking if i am taking section here in this in this component you get on the top the body of the caudate nucleus and uh, the tail of the suppose if i take section here i will get only head of the caudate nucleus so like that you we, you have a, a tail of the caudate nucleus here in this particular section now this this forms the internal capsule this is the internal capsule so now what are the this is about the parts i again repeat a caudate nucleus the putamen the globus pallidus subthalamic nucleus substantia nigra the caudate and putamen perform similar functions they are known as a striatum they receive input from the uh, premotor cortex that is striatum sometimes it is called neostriatum that means the, the newer aspect then putamen and the globus pallidus put together uh, something like a lens is arranged in series see you just see that a different you have a two three lenses if i if i go back to the previous uh, uh, previous one you just see that uh, one lens here another lens here and the three lenses uh, in series they are arranged they are called a uh, lentiform nucleus also because this looks like a lentil lentil uh, that uh, dicotyledonous uh, botanical uh, grains so lentils having when they are germinating you have the the inside uh, some uh, things germinating uh, layer coming up uh, so that germinating layer is the uh, thalamus uh, so maybe that is another reason why the lentiform has come so this is anyway uh, for our understanding the lenticular nucleus consists of the putamen and globus pallidus the putamen and globus pallidus this is putamen here and this is globus pallidus the caudate and the putamen put together as a striatum because functionally they are similar now move on these are the parts of the basal ganglia i again repeat the striatum lentiform nucleus we often use the terms uh, as a, as a striatum that means that it may be putamen it may be caudate okay so now uh, we move on to the various uh, nuclei of the basal ganglia now i have classified the basal ganglia nuclei in three groups input nuclei that is uh, which is receiving information the output nuclei that gives away the information to the other structures in the brain and intrinsic nuclei that are located within the basal ganglia structures the input nuclei include or they, they receive inputs from the cortex this is the cortex from the thalamus so thalamus this this is thalamus there and from the uh, substantia nigra especially 
the compact portion of the substantia nigra. The substantia nigra, though it forms the input, uh, they, it forms the part of the basal ganglia, so it provides the input to the striatum. So now we have three components. It receives the, the basal ganglia nuclei receive input from three different components. That is a, uh, from cortex, thalamus, and substantia nigra compacta reach to caudate nucleus, uh, putamen, and the nuclear circumvents. I will come back to this nucleic circumvents because this is a uh, additional uh, part of the basal ganglia. Then the outputs go from the, bas the basal ganglia structures that provide output are the GPI, globus pallidus interna. This is globus pallidus interna. From here, the output goes to thalamus or uh, to the pontopeduncular nucleus. So that is uh, the, uh, especially GPI is one of them. And uh, we have, this part is the substantia nigra. Now the substantia nigra also receives input, uh, the input, the substantia nigra compacta. Now the substantia nigra reticularis, that provides output uh, to the thalamus and the pontopeduncular nucleus. This is a pontopeduncular nucleus here, the, the blue one, blue oval mass here. Now the intrinsic nuclei are one, because globus pallidus externa, this external part, it becomes the intrinsic, it is uh, sandwiched between the, the striatum that is a putamen and the caudate nucleus and to the globus pallidus interna and the subthalamic nucleus because a subthalamic nucleus is connected between GPE and GP subthalamic nucleus and GPI something like that so that means a subthalamic nucleus is another intrinsic nucleus then there are several intrastriatal, either in the putamen or in the caudate. There are cholinergic uh, neurons. They are intrastriatal connections. In addition, we have inputs from the substantia nigra also uh, to the uh, to the caudate and uh, putamen. So that we have considered here, but that also be can be included as a part of the intrinsic nuclei. Here I have mentioned in this part, we have, I have named them one, two, three, four. So one is this uh, caudate, two is putamen, three is uh, uh, globus pallidus uh, externa and interna, and the fourth is the sub subthalamic nucleus. Uh, fifth is the uh, substantia nigra, and we have a pontopeduncular nucleus. Okay, so these are the nuclei, the input, the receiving inputs, the outputs, providing outputs from the basal ganglia, and within the basal ganglia, the structure, the nuclei. Sometimes uh, there are additional structures because uh, these are five primary structures or nuclei which are involved in the basal ganglia functions, the caudate, putamen, globus pallidus, uh, subthalamic nucleus, substantia nigra. So these are one, do not want to forget about them. In addition, the, the, there are other parts, they are also partly involved in the basal ganglia functions, like amygdala, maybe the emotional components associated, that is the amygdala does, the memory and the, then uh, nucleus accumbens. This is for the cognitive in terms of the reward functions. The pontopeduncular nucleus, that is for, uh, uh, this is pontopeduncular nucleus here. Uh, this is the amygdala. 
caudate is here. This is an amygdala. And this is a red one is the nucleus accumbens. And uh, this is a pontoparangular nucleus. And even the carpus callosum between the connecting, between connections between the um, two hemispheres, the carpus callosum, and a part of the internal capsule. If you are, if you are looking at the, the structures here, because uh, this, this is the internal capsule there, and uh, this part of the internal capsule also having the fibers uh, uh, containing the, uh, performing the uh, basal ganglia functions. Okay, so now uh, I have added five additional parts. So if you, because each one of them have a, a particular significance in terms of the basal ganglia functions. Then comes, uh, we have this uh, plan of action, the voluntary movement. I have already explained about it. So today what we are looking at, uh, we are looking at this component, uh, the cortical association area that is the if I, if I briefly talk about this, the it starts with an idea. Idea provides information to the cortical association area. Cortical association area sends information to the premotor and motor cortex. And the premotor and motor cortex sends information uh, to the spinal cord. Uh, this is from the motor cortex and that will be for the moment. And uh, this part, the cortical association area, in connection with the lateral cerebellum and basal ganglia, sends information to premotor cortex. The premotor cortex in turn, in turn is interacting with the basal ganglia. Today we are seeing this component, the cortical association area and the premotor area as one component which are inputs to the basal ganglia. That in turn gives to the motor cortex and then the action. This is the plan of action. We are seeing the information uh, I have made in this box. Now, normally, the basal ganglia is connected in series with the premotor cortex and the motor cortex. The structures are the premotor cortex. This is one. This is the entire cerebral cortex I'm trying to show here the premotor cortex, then the information comes to basal ganglia. If you are, if you are looking at this, uh, the premotor cortex, information comes to basal ganglia, the basal ganglia here. From the basal ganglia, information reaches to the motor cortex through thalamus. Okay, now the motor cortex, uh, this is where the pyramidal tracts originate. This is the pyramidal tract. So this, uh, um, that would descend down, that would descend down and cross to the opposite side by making a pyramid, by making a pyramid that forms the corticospinal tract. So now this is the very brief plan of the, the basal ganglia circuitry, the premotor cortex, the basal ganglia, then to the thalamus, then to the motor cortex and subsequently to the corticospinal tract. Now, suppose what I have made here, I have added the parts of the basal ganglia. In the basal ganglia, we have a direct circuit and indirect circuit. Now, I am trying to provide you the basis for a direct circuit. The direct circuit is comprised of these five elements, the premotor cortex, the striatum, the globus pallidus interna, thalamus, and motor cortex. So now, keeping these structures here, these structures here in the in the units, the premotor cortex sends information to the striatum. Caudate plus putamen is a striatum. It's also known as a neostriatum or neostriatum. So then, then from the striatum, it will send information to the Globus pallidus interna. That means interna is an output nuclei. So from here, the output goes to thalamus, and from thalamus, it will come back to the thalamocortical projections to the motor cortex. Here in the thalamus, it is the ventro anterior uh, nucleus of the thalamus. And then sends information to the motor cortex, and from the motor cortex, the corticospinal tract comes. Okay, so now to extend this circuit a little further, 
so now what i am adding another information here this a direct circuit is an hyperkinetic loop i am just adding a uh, the xn component of this direct circuit so now the elements of the direct circuit are same premotor cortex striatum globus pallidus interna the thalamus the motor cortex here you just look at that now i have changed the colors of these arrows these blue arrows indicate the excitatory inputs the red arrows indicate the uh, inhibitory inputs now from the premotor cortex it reaches to the striatum the excitatory inputs reach to the striatum the striatum in turn uh, connects to the globus pallidus via inhibitory inputs that means uh, so it will send in inputs here these are inhibitory in nature that means that inhibits the globus pallidus now that inhibition that means that because of this thing globus pallidus interna sends fewer in inhibitions to the thalamus now if this is sending information here this is more excited then it inhibits this if this inhibits the information going going out from this is a lesser and if this is lesser this is not inhibited this is going with a full range full range of activity that means excite this is hyperkinetic i have put this thing this is a circuit this is a direct circuit this is known as a hyperkinetic circuit to make you understand uh, mathematically say for example plus this is a plus here this is a plus i have put this is a minus here that is inhibitory inhibitory neuron striato pallidal uh, striato pallidal inputs is a gaba argic input that inhibits this this pathway this is minus here then pallido thalamic this is globus pallidus interna but to the thalamus this is also inhibitory this is inhibitory here so then uh, thalamocortical this is thalamocortical from the ventro anterior nucleus of thalamus uh, to the cortex it is excitatory if i multiply or if you just use a simple mathematics uh, the multiplication of all these units say for example plus 1 minus 1 minus 1 plus 1 so the net result is plus it is an excitatory so the number of uh, Uh, activity going from thalamus to motor is increased so that enhances the activity of the corticospinal tract what does it mean so it means that it starts the action or it uh, uh, augments the action whatever whatever the way you talk about suppose it starts the action or it augments the action this is what the uh, direct circuit do okay so now once we have looked into the direct circuit i want to add one more circuit so here here in this situation i am adding a indirect circuit in this indirect circuit in this particular segment i have not included the direct circuit because uh, i want to mix them in the next segment or in the next level so what happens the premotor cortex sends information to the striatum that is the first thing from the striatum it in the previous one it was going to this globus pallidus interna no the striatum sends information to the the globus pallidus externa okay this is globus pallidus externa and globus pallidus externa uh, talks to subthalamic nucleus the globus pallidus externa uh, sends information to the subthalamic nucleus then from the subthalamic nucleus the output of the subthalamic nucleus reach the globus pallidus interna because the striatum is not sending information directly to gpi it will be sending information through gpe subthalamic nucleus and then to gpi that is why it is called indirect circuit and from the globus pallidus interna again the path is similar it sends information to the uh, ventro anterior nucleus of thalamus and then to the the motor cortex for the action now if we if we look into the the mathematics of this particular 
uh, loop or circuit. You just see that it is excitatory here, yes. Then the striatum to globus pallidus externa is inhibitory, is inhibitory, GABAergic. Then globus pallidus externa to subthalamic nucleus is inhibitory. And from the subthalamic nucleus to globus pallidus is excitatory. And globus pallidus interna to thalamus is inhibitory. And then again, thalamocortical projection is excitatory. I am multiplying these units here. The plus, minus, you just say that plus one, minus one, minus one, plus one, minus one, and plus one. Multiply this thing. The net result will be minus one. It will be minus. So what is that minus means? It it whatever the inputs are reaching here from the thalamocortical uh, projections are not are reduced or diminished or less. So this this carries the inhibitory um, number of impulses reaching or less fewer. Thus, it is an inhibitory circuit which is reaching to the cortex. That is why it is called a hypokinetic loop. Okay, uh, let me repeat about the indirect circuit. This indirect loop involves the seven segments. Premotor cortex, striatum, GPA, subthalamic nucleus, GPI, thalamus, motor cortex. Now I have sequenced them in the same order. So this is a premotor cortex, the striatum, globus pallidus externa, subthalamic nucleus, globus pallidus interna, and thalamus and back to motor cortex. Then from here, the corticospinal tracts originate. Okay, so this is hypokinetic as I have shown here with the mathematics for you people. So if I were to explain that uh, if uh, this, is, uh, this is inhibited less than the inhibition of the inhibition is more subthalamic activity, more subthalamic activity activates more globus pallidus activity. The more globus pallidus activity means uh, inhibition of the thalamus, then thalamus uh, uh, will not send as many impulses as before. In the other circuit, so it will be here, that will be excitatory. So now indirect circuit is a hypokinetic loop or inhibitory loop, direct circuit is a excited reload. I have just combined both direct and indirect circuits here in this particular diagram. Now I tell you, I will first show you the direct pathway, the premotor cortex, the striatum, the GPI, thalamus, and the motor cortex. This is direct. The premotor cortex, the GPE, subthalamic nucleus, GPI, thalamus, and motor cortex. This is indirect. This is indirect part. Okay. So now that means our actions are alternating because if this is sending information, this sends both. It will have a excitatory as well as inhibitory inputs. The excitatory inputs are the first one to begin because the actions may start. Then after the actions may start, there will be some checking or correction or uh, uh, the restraint by this indirect circuit. Okay, so now this is a course adjustment. Suppose whenever we are trying to make a motion, this direct and indirect circuits, they will make a course movement, course action, that is a gross, gross movement, either uh, uh, to increase or decrease. This is like a course adjustment in case of a microscope. Then fine adjustment is made by another basal ganglia area known as a substantia nigra. So again, this substantia nigra is located here almost in the, in the midbrain area and uh, it is uh, having a black uh, uh, Neuro, the neurons are stained uh, dark with the silver staining. That is why the uh, nigra, the black. 
the like a black body substantia nigra and they have a uh, two components substantia nigra compacta and substantia nigra um, reticularis the compacta substantia nigra compacta sends information uh, to the striatum so this is known as a, a nigro striatal tract so that means uh, it will fine tune or adjust the activity of the uh, striatal activity now uh, you look here the nigro striatal tract is a, a tract which secretes dopamine as a neurotransmitter it has two set of neurons and these two set of neurons so in win, in in one set of neuron these more number uh, they they have been expressed with the d1 receptors the d1 receptors are uh, excitatory and these d1 receptors are making a direct contact with the gpi so that means they are participating in the uh, direct circuit so that means dopaminergic neurons which are reaching to the the direct pathway this is the direct pathway or uh, expressed with the d1 receptors which are excitatory and what happens this is excited once it is excited so what happens there will be more more inhibition or uh, more excitation of these that means a more inhibition of gpi if there is a more inhibition of gpi what happens the the control over thalamus is diminished so that means uh, there is a greater activity that is the uh, that is the meaning there is a greater activity here this becomes uh, uh, very large this output becomes uh, large so this is uh, when when we stimulate the d1 receptors suppose when you stimulate because the indirect pathway the neurons which are reaching to indirect pathway that is they are connected to gpe that is the globus pallidus externa so these are expressed with the d2 receptors the d2 receptors are inhibitory so the d1 receptors are excitatory d2 receptors are inhibitory so that means uh, they will produce more inhibition as they did more excitation they will pro produce more inhibition of the uh, thalamocortical uh, uh, output so now if you just see that it is connected to the d2 receptors already uh, the uh, from the striatum the output is going to a gpa inhibitory output this when it is reaching and the inhibitory output is enhanced and there is more inhibition of gpa if there is more inhibition of gpa and the subthalamic nucleus is uh, um, not receiving the inputs so that means uh, it will have a intrinsic oscillatory activity so there will be more output from the subthalamic nucleus from the subthalamic nucleus to the gpi this is an excitatory output so that means the gpi is uh, excited more if the gpi is excited more it inhib it inhibits the thalamus more and if the thalamus is inhibited the output of the thalamus is decreased so that is the output Thing we are that means uh, there is a balance that means substantia nigra by having these things uh, it will try to uh, say for example switch mechanisms or oscillatory mechanisms uh, it will try to uh, one time start and one time stop stop it uh, nicely or uh, uh, perfectly perfectly and uh, start it. perfectly so that means there is no uh, vagueness so this is a fine tuning of the circuits now that is uh, that's not enough so that's not enough uh, this fine tuning is uh, uh, is not balanced in the in the sense uh, that means it is going uh, um, wayward wayward so that that, uh, that uh, suppose if the d1 receptors are not balanced now this this fine tuning is balanced by another networking which is present within the striatum this is a colin intrastriatal uh, cholinergic networking so now we introduce another fine tuner there the cholinergic these are acetylcholine containing neurons uh, located in the striatum these cholinergic networks 
control both the D1, these neurons, direct and neur direct neur dopamine neurons and indirect neurons. These direct neurons are expressed with the muscarinic receptors of the acetylcholine. And indirect ones are expressed with the nicotinic receptors. So acetylcholine acts on two types of receptors, the muscarinic receptors. The muscarinic receptor is the G-protein coupled receptor. The nicotinic receptor is a ion antiphoric porotic receptor or it is a it acts as a, a cation channel that means a ligand gated uh, cation channel the nicotinic receptors now when the muscarinic receptor is activated because they are expressed with the muscarinic receptors it is inhibitory it is inhibitory and uh, uh, this the dopamine one is excited so these two are balanced so that means whatever the output goes, the balanced output reaches the uh, thalamus. So then thalamus bring, gets out the balanced output. Similarly here, if you are looking at the acetylcholine, the nicotinic receptors are expressed here on the indirect pathway. The nicotinic receptors are excitatory. Whereas if you are looking at the D2 receptors are inhibitory, so now this excitatory and inhibitory receptors, they are in a balance or an offset mode so that the whatever the output goes here from the in, in the indirect pathway to the uh, globus pallidus externa is a balanced output reaches. So now these plastic changes in the synaptic activity are brought about by the action brought about by the action so that uh, we have a, a balanced situation if you are looking at here dopamine on the excitatory thalamic output so we have a dopamine one receptors enhance the enhance the activity the thalamocortical activity and uh, dopamine two receptors uh, decrease the thalamocortical activity these are the fine two fine tuners uh, maybe here also the same thing, uh, the acetylcholine on the excitatory thalamic output, uh, the muscarinic receptors decrease via direct pathway, they decrease via direct pathway, and uh, nicotinic receptors increase via direct pathway. So that means uh, this, uh, whatever the thalamic outputs, they try to balance each other. These two uh, indirect and uh, circuits, so that's a fine tuners especially one from the substantia nigra and uh, one from the uh, uh, intrastriatal uh, cholinergic neurons. Okay, so now uh, I have uh, mentioned about the direct circuits, indirect circuits, the fine tuning by dopamine receptor, dopaminergic neurons and fine tuning by the cholinergic neurons. Now, here I will just mention about various pathways Corticostriatal pathway, cortex to the striatum, this pathway, corticostriatal pathway, this is a glutamatergic, I'm talking about a neurotransmitter, the corticostriatal glutamatergic. Striatopallidal, striatum, this is striatum, this box, this box, to the pallidum, this red arrow, red arrow here and red arrow here, this is garbage. Pallido, this is pallidal, pallidothalamic, the pallidothalamic is inhibitory, that is garbage. Nigrostriatal, nigrostriatal, I am just mentioning substantia nigra compacta. I have divided here the uh, substantia nigra, the substantia nigra compacta gives inputs to the striatum and the substantia nigra uh, reticularis uh, gives uh, uh, inputs to the uh, thalamus. That means it is along with the GPI. Now, SNC, that is substantia nigra compacta, that is a nigrostriatal tract, is dopaminergic. This is, this is what happens in, this is what is destroyed in the Parkinsonism. Then subthalamopallidal pathway. This is subthalamus to the pallidus. This is the pathway. This is the pathway. The subthalamopallidal pathway is glutamatergic. Glutamatergic. Intrastriatal cholinergic. 
green one. Thalamocortical, thalamus to the cortex is glutamatergic. Striatonigral, so that means uh, this is striatum to the nigra, substantia nigra here. It, it comes here. This is uh, gabargic. So now, one thing I would like to emphasize here, these components are reciprocally connected, which to avoid or make a clar clarity, we have shown the uh, predominant action, that is the total um, resultant action we have shown with the arrows. Resultant action means this is the forward motion. Otherwise, they all have a, a sort of a reciprocal connections from each component. Now, I have mentioned about the transmitters. What are the transmitters? They come down to four, glutamate, GABA, dopamine, acetylcholine. These are the four uh, neurotransmitters involved in the basal ganglia. Now, I just uh, revise you about the connections. The afferents receive input from premotor cortex, from all cortical areas, from the substantia nigra, compacta, and from the thalamus. So I mentioned you here, no, uh, thalamus and uh, the striatum, we have not connected. Even the thalamus also gives inputs to the striatum thalamostriatal, uh, these things. But uh, for our clarity purpose, I have not shown. So these are afferents. The efferents are the output goes from GPI1, that is going to the thalamus. From the substantia nigra to the thalamus. From which part of the thalamus? Ventral anterior nucleus of the thalamus. In addition, this uh, GPI and substantia nigra output are also reaching to the, the midbrain structures, the pontopeduncular nucleus. The pontopeduncular nucleus, which is uh, uh, around the collicular region where the visual and uh, the auditory and uh, the proprioceptive sensory inputs are uh, correlated or uh, put together. So this pontopeduncular nucleus, that is the essential component for the maintenance of the posture. So now these connections are reaching here. Having considered the connections of the basal ganglia, though it looks a little complicated, I have made it simple. You, you have to revise, then you, it will become clear. Now, now let us come with the functions of the basal ganglia. I name here the planning and programming of the voluntary action. That is number one. Then executing the whatever the planning and program, programming has given. Executing the pattern of movements. This execution of the pattern of movements are mainly involved by the putaminon, putamin containing putamin neurons or putaminergic circuit. I will I will explain it. Cognitive control of the voluntary action. This cognitive control of the voluntary action is done by the caudate nucleus. Timing of the voluntary action, the scaling of the voluntary action, maintaining the tone and the posture required for the voluntary action, for a given voluntary action. Then it will dampen the oscillations of agonist and the antagonist group of muscles because we have the oscillations and it will dampen or attenuate the oscillations of the agonist and antagonist group of muscles. And it acts as a switch for the voluntary action. That means turning on or turning off the voluntary action. I repeat, I have mentioned eight functions here, planning and programming, execution of the pattern movements, the cognitive control of voluntary action, timing of voluntary action, scaling of voluntary actions, the posture and uh, tone required for the action, the dampening of the oscillations of the agonist and antagonist group of muscles, and uh, 
a switch for the modern reaction. Now, we consider each one of them uh, briefly in each component. Now, the first part is the planning and programming of the action. This planning, just uh, let, us, let us see this example. Here is an action you have asked somebody to set the plates in the dining table. This is an action. Uh, setting the plates in a dining table is an action. Now that individual, now he has to make keep his hands free. And his idea centers provide information on which group of muscle to be required. Say, for example, he was uh, standing somewhere else. So then that means he has to the site where those plates are placed. He has to move to that. So that means a movement. So then he reached to the cupboard or the place where the plates are placed. So then after moving, then he has to um, lift the hands to reach the plates. So then lifting up the hand requires lifting up the joints, the shoulder joint, the elbow joint, the wrist joint. It's not at all. So the uh, shoulder joint, the elbow joint, wrist joints, it's not only lifting. It has to be maintained at a particular level. Say, for example, if, if it is located somewhere here, uh, this, this part. So then he has to move to that side. That means a particular uh, location. Then grab the plate. Then bring the plate with a particular care to the dining table. Then keep it on the dining table. And at every level, you have to maintain the posture. Suppose at any level, if you lose your posture, the plate will break. So now this one, then another thing. Suppose you are lifting up for six plates together. If you are lifting the six plates together, you have to have that uh, the intensity of the muscle action. That means how much uh, uh, force is required to hold those plates. How much care and what is the time duration in which uh, you have to take it. And uh, uh, the spacing. See what happens uh, whenever you are in a hurry, you want to do certain actions and you try to grab this thing and that and suddenly uh, you will not be able to get the plate and the plate will drop and plate will break. So that is uh, uh, so that maintenance of the timing, duration and intensity of action are also to be done. And at the end, once you have placed it on the table and uh, he has to say, yes, I have done it. So stop the action. So this is a one plan of action. I have uh, maybe I have not uh, given the total sequence of the events. Uh, the sequence of the events is much, much longer than what I have described here. The sequence of actions are many, many than what I have described. Now, just I read it here. Plan the action in association with the inputs from the uh, lateral cerebellum and the association areas of the brain. I now identify the group of muscles for the action. Once you identify the group of muscles for the action and how long each of these group of muscles to be activated in sequence, that has to be determined. Then the sequence of uh, actions, so that means uh, the first, the shoulder joint, elbow joint, and the hands, the fingers. So in, the, in, in which order they are going to be contracted then there is no use if my hand uh, the these uh, finger movements that take place and uh, uh, shoulder uh, joint is not lifting it will not perform the work then the plan the postural requirements for the action because each action requires the postural requirement now uh, look at this uh, particular uh, picture this is a very very uh, dynamic picture uh, especially for the what I see for the uh, basal ganglia actions. There are so many voluntary actions. One voluntary action here driving the motorbike, the cycling. Okay, these are uh, two, two here walking, 
So this is, uh, see, see, looking here, then she tries to see what, what they are doing. So if, and uh, here, if uh, this is, but uh, each one of these actions are dependent upon each other. And uh, if you are looking at here, this child is trying to pull the hand here. So that's dynamism. And uh, here, look here, the, the another reaction. You have another reaction. This baby is trying to, uh, trying to adjust itself. Then this girl uh, trying to look here and there, trying to uh, care for herself. And then here, uh, you can see that. Uh, see, and, uh, so this whole dynamic range of actions, so each one of them, suppose if I were to analyze each one of them, have the sequence of events as I have enumerated in the side uh, part. So that means, uh, suppose if I were to take and describe this girl. So she is driving, she has to drive or she has to ride, uh, say, the pedal, uh, pedal the cycle in such a way that she should not hit this. And she should not stop because she, she is having another person here. And uh, look here. So then there is, there is a vehicle coming here. This vehicle is coming here. And before that vehicle comes, she has to pass through. And she should not come here in this lane. So that so these are various plans. Uh, only one thing I have just. Uh, so for each one of them, there is a planning and programming. For each one of these actions. There are so many actions uh, uh, I cannot describe. Uh, maybe I will be just completing uh, the one hour, uh, especially with this figure. Anyway, giving you an example. These are the voluntary actions. Uh, so involved in so many dynam dynamics, so it is totally dynamic. The voluntary action is totally dynamic, and uh, each one see each one have a different different uh, um, the stance. So this person is talking to someone else uh, like that. So now coming back here, so the second part, the second function is the execution of the pattern of movements. Because I cannot keep on going with each one of these figures and uh, uh, trying to describe. I have already given you the example. You can imagine and you can construct your own uh, uh, the planning and program uh, or sequencing of the actions. Now, the execution after planning, it's the execution of the pattern of movements. What are the pattern of movements? The pattern of movements are the lateral motion, weight transfer, forward motion, up and down motion, coordinating upper and lower body movements. All these things are pattern movements. Say, for example, uh, movements like walking, bending, reaching, scratching, running, kicking, shuffling sideways, moving around the people and objects, eye-hand coordination, eye-body coordination. All these things are examples. Or even you are looking at these examples are cutting a paper with scissors. It's the most difficult job cutting a paper with the scissors. You just see that you have to have the scissors in your hand and uh, that uh, uh, scissors has to be uh, held in a particular position. Or any tool as a matter of fact. And it, any tool as a matter of fact. Hammering a nail. So that means uh, you have to steady the nail. And then you should not want to hit your hand, hit your nails, hit your uh, uh, nails or hit your uh, fingers. Shooting a basketball through a hoop, passing a football, throwing a ball, as happens in case of uh, any any ball plays, or catching a cricket ball, that holding the catch, or the shoveling movement. That means you take something and uh, throw throw the things, solving moments of adult, the vocalization, the controlled use of tools, all these things, including the spoons, the chopsticks, the forks, all these things are uh, the examples of the uh, voluntary actions, which are very, very complex. Even I, 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 wish, to, I wish to say that uh, even uh, uh, tying his shoelace is a more complex uh, voluntary action. Then the talking, drinking, swallowing, 
or voluntary actions over involuntary actions. That means uh, they are voluntary to begin with, then they become involuntary. So these are the basic pattern movement. Uh, there is the execution of the pattern movements. Now, execution of the pattern movements uh, start start in the premotor cortex. This is the premotor cortex. So these these lines. Now these premotor cortex uh, reach to the putamen here. This is the putamen, and from the putamen, they will reach to the direct circuit, the GPI, and then to the thalamus and back to the motor cortex. That's one. The second, from this, uh, they will go through the indirect circuits. That the indirect circuit is coming through the uh, subthalamus, subthalamus, and then to the thalamus, and then to the cortex. So that's the indirect pathway. Also, the inputs reach to the substantia nigra. And this substantia nigra, in turn, try to modulate the striatal activity, the putaminergic activity. So this is uh, three things they have shown here. The premotor cortex, the putamen, GPI, thalamus, that's the direct circuit, premotor cortex, putamen, GPE, uh, subthalamic nucleus, GPI, thalamus, these are the indirect circuits. So this is a direct circuit. This is a indirect circuit. Both are activated, and uh, that is where the X pattern is executed. Now you just see that uh, that's one of the example here. Uh, this dog is jumping through this fire uh, rings, fire rings. So you just see that it does not get hurt. Similarly, this man is jumping through this fire uh, uh, ring, which you might have seen in the circus you just see that so here so that means he requires so much of a precision so much of an action that means he should not want to touch it there is there is a, a cognitive component associated here in this particular uh, image so that means he has to pass through this ring which is having a fire and that would pass through the um, uh, he has to pass easily. So that is the uh, some of the action where the how the pattern movements are executed. Now, this is uh, another important picture. What is happening? This is exactly an event happened in September 5th, uh, uh, 2012. In Sivkasi, this fireworks factory uh, got the fire. And when the fireworks factory got the fire and there was a blast or a fire in this and the people are running now why the people are running how much time it has taken this is a part of the cognitive function of the movement the cognitive because they know that it is dangerous there is a smoke there and they want to run away from the place uh, so that they will not be suffocated so like that so now, with this, with this background, we move on to the third component, uh, a cognitive control of movements. The cognitive control of sequence of pattern movements, it is operated through the coded circuits. Movements are executed according to the previously learned events in response to situation. I have shown the situation there. There's a fire, fire alarm. Alarming or life-threatening. So these are... Uh, potentially dangerous uh, situations. So now, let us examine one, one of the examples. Example one, the difference of a reaction of an infant and an adult in, for the presence of snake in their vicinity. Say, for example, uh, in the bed where the infant is being placed, uh, you have a snake and in the bed where the adult is sleeping, the snake is placed. What would be the response? The infant is not cared. It holds on to it and puts it in the mouth or uh, it plays around. Whereas an adult, what happens? He will jump out of the bed and uh, he will just run away or he will try to uh, get a uh, something which can, uh, which you can uh, 
uh, kill the uh, snake or uh, whatever. So first he attempts to run away from the scene or uh, then he realizes, then he wants to control the situation. So that attempt to run away from the scene, that is a cognition. Cognition means he knows that a snake is a dangerous species, wherein so it may kill him, whereas the infant does not know. This is a cognitive component. So this reaction does not lose the time, because if you lose the time, you the snake will bite you. So that is the type of uh, uh, cognitive component of the movement. The second example I have already uh, shown in this picture. So that means they know that this is smoke and all these things. Uh, there may be many more uh, blurs. Uh, they may be injured and they want to run away from the scene. Then uh, uh, another thing, uh, suppose you had gone to a trekking. Sometimes uh, uh, you go to this Tirumala uh, uh, by walking or trekking. There are also wild animals there. And if you, in the night also it is open, if the wild animal approaches to you, what do you do? So you try to run away. Instantly you run away, automatically protect yourself, turning away from the wild animal and uh, beginning to run. Or if there are some trees, trying to climb the trees or trying to do something so that to protect ourselves. These are cognitive because they, they're the impending life threatening for that individuals. Without the cognitive functions, the person might not have the instinctive knowledge what is what will happen. And this instinctive knowledge, it should happen quickly without thinking much because thinking requires a long loop neural networking. So it should be instant, it should be quick, and it should be appropriate. So all these things are happening in these three examples. Thus, cognitive control of the motor activity is a part of the learned element which has come through the basal ganglia. Here, the caudate circuit or caudate nucleus is involved. Now, I will tell about that. Thus, cognitive control of the motor activity determines subconsciously or within seconds the patterns of movement required to achieve a complex goal that might save the individuals. And this should happen in, without losing much time. Now, coming back here, this is the circuitry. So this circuitry originates from the entire a global, global approach, all the parts of the cortex, all the parts of the cortex, they will be uh, put together. They will be put together and now so they that means they will reach to the caudate nucleus that means uh, uh, from the frontal then pre motor motor the sensory sensory component sensory association the occipital auditory and even olfactory also all these things would come or uh, comes upon the caudate nucleus now the caudate nucleus through the through the direct and indirect pathways, direct and indirect pathways, uh, they will uh, um, send back to the premotor cortex. And uh, this one is going through the ventral anterior nucleus of thalamus uh, to the frontal area. And uh, here, the insular cortex and the frontal cortex are also involved. Overall, the person is trying to run away. This is one of the a cognitive circuit of the basal ganglia function. Now here uh, you just see that the person trying to catch the ball, trying to catch the ball, or you just see that uh, this timing of the action. What you are seeing, so the, they are focused, it's highly focused with the postural adjustments and ready to receive ready to receive with the, with the whatever the posture they are having. The, this involves both cognitive as well as uh, the pattern activity, that is the caudate and putamen circuits. The learned patterns of action while performing require exact timing of an event, exact timing of an event. Because if you come later, it ball will fall down. 
if you come early you have to wait for long and for long means you will not be able to uh, sustain that particular posture uh, an example for this uh, timing of an action here in uh, in our own campus uh, if i want to get out of the campus we have a highway there in front of the uh, main gate and that's a very busy highway so a lot of uh, large many uh, that the vehicular traffic is very high and especially those uh, trucks uh, the heavy trucks bus cars so on so forth and now crossing becomes very difficult now how we do we go there wait and then though some vehicles are coming at a distance then we assess okay whether we pass then we pass the crossing a bg road where lots of vehicles are passing we all adopt certain things that is one of the basal ganglia function in that case the person waits for such a time in which he is able to make through and then reach to the other side of the road or second example is catching a ball in a cricket bat match here you just see that they have given that. throwing oneself on the uh, ground for a diving or coming under the ball to catch the ball this is achieved by both the caudate and tendon circuits because they require both one cognitive component as well as because there is a visual visual thinking and all the cognitive components so plus the pattern activity both of them are working together scaling up an action the scaling means the intensity at which we perform the action the learned patterns of action while performing we may require to assess the intensity or gradation of the voluntary movement okay so now uh, I, I will just uh, give the example and then the example one if one is asked to write alphabet a on a piece of paper and on a chalkboard so you just see that so here is a person writing on the uh, blackboard uh, that uh, a plus b whatever the alphabets uh, we are not interested in what is written on this thing and you see that this is the blackboard you can assess the size of the blackboard with the size of the uh, person person and the, the entire thing then here on this side I have a piece of paper this is the a4 size paper with a pen and uh, whatever for dimension sake i have kept i have written this uh, a plus b uh, square you can just see the size of the letters size of the letters are small here on the piece of paper and the size of the letters are large here on this so this is the scale though even if i were to write it on the board i will also write it something like that only this particular part of it without any thinking i would just do that part or this part so this is a, a timing and the scaling uh, of the action so for example if one asks to write a alphabet a on a piece of paper and on a chalkboard automatically the person writes a, a la, letter size a small or big as required a big in case of a chalkboard and a small in case of a uh, paper another example is uh, you want to pass a ball to a person okay now uh, you have two persons one person is at the 5 meters distance another is at the 50 meter distance now with a 5 meter person you just give a just a small drop that means the intensity of the action is less with a 50 meter apart you will throw it with the intensity so that means you use less effort for a 5 meter person more effort for the latter so this again requires the both the caudate and putamen circuits together that is the scaling of an action now i have mentioned that this is one of the example of the scaling of the action and uh, here also is an example of the scaling of an action scaling means whether to run away because the vehicle is coming or vehicles are coming you can just see that uh, this baby is uh, this boy is running so this run away this uh, whenever we cross the or cross the road so that means this is scaling of the action 
Now, six, maintaining the muscle tone and posture uh, required for the action. The tone of the muscle is maintained by uh, descending reticulospinal or vestibulospinal projections uh, to the gamma motor neurons and then to alpha motor neurons through the 1A. The broad basal ganglia exerts inhibitory or excitatory activity on these projections as required. I will show the actions. Posture on extensor group of muscles are involved in posture maintenance. So there is always a extensor activity for the maintenance. In case of a Parkinson's, the flexion attitude, so just like this, is seen in a Parkinson's disease. In addition, there are other associated movements while we walk or we we'll talk or we do some actions. So these are part of the postural components. The basal ganglia, uh, basal ganglia output coordinate them. In the absence of uh, basal ganglia, these associate movements are lost. Now let us see what is happening. So you can just see the reverse hand. The, this, this itself is a planning. This is a planning trying to just touch it, touch it and see the posture adopted, posture adopted. Here, the back hand is one of the long tennis, uh, one of the great player there. So now he just making a back backhand uh, return, backhand return. So you just see that how he is doing and you see the adopt, adoption of the posture, this is the posture. So all, all these actions. Now here in the shuttlecock here again. So now he wants to reach there and he wants to touch that and he wants to place it over the net. So that is another, that means the intensity, timing, the posture, everything is there. Here also, it's almost the ball is dropped to the ground and he does not want to touch the ground here. If he touches the ground, it is out. So now if he just wants to lift it just like uh, anything and then make a shot. These are some of these, uh, um, what, what I am talking, the actions with the uh, posture and associate movements. In each one of them, there are associate movements. Associate movements are the hand, hand, leg, leg there, leg there, hand there. So all these things are uh, posture and associate movements. Now, you, you must have seen this parade, this wonderful, uh, it looks beautiful in a video picture. So that means going together and uh, these are associate movements, both the, the legs and the limb, upper limb and the lower limb, their movements and with the commitments there. Looks good. Similarly, the joggers, you can just see that. The associate movements, associate movements, you can just see that the hand, how it is flexed. The, this one is a uh, forward, this is opposite, uh, lower limb is forward here, same thing. So these associate movements uh, here. So this, these are some of the associate movements. Uh, maybe basis of these associate movements, you can just see that how, how it is working. The swinging of the arms, uh, swinging of the arms, uh, see, look here. Now, this swinging of the arms uh, is, uh, you just see that uh, what these group of muscles there are. This group of muscles there, they are working and uh, they are something like a quadruped. So that means this is a dog there and they forelimb and uh, see forelimb and uh, hind limb motions, they are crossed. Same thing happens in case of movements. So that means uh, swinging of arms uh, is one of the associate movements and uh, in the erect posture there. Now, the another important aspect about the, the basal ganglia function is uh, damping or attenuation of the oscillations uh, of agonist and antagonist group of muscles. Usually, we have uh, oscillations. Uh, our uh, muscles or agonist and antagonist groups of muscles have uh, oscillations. And these oscillations are dampened by the basal ganglia outputs to the pontopedangular nucleus and to the cortex. Normally, these uh, there are oscillations of the agonist and antagonist group of muscles. 
and they are dampened by the projections to the pontopedicular nucleus so and they are inhibitory so they they are they suppress them so that the, the spinal motor neuron pools are silent so that means there are no oscillations suppose in the beginning when you are trying to learn in action you will have more tremors more of these oscillations in the absence of input from the basal ganglia what you see you see these oscillations and uh, these oscillations as a tremor that is a tremor there or a writhing movements as in, as happens in case of ketosis or a sudden violent motions as happens in case of a, a bellissimus these are uh, the important things uh, because the basal ganglia uh, attenuate the oscillations basal ganglia because uh, this for any voluntary action to be turned on or turned off to turn on because of the activity of the direct circuitry that is the switch that begins the start in action turning on suppose a person with a basal ganglia disorder he sits on there on the chair and tries to get up for long thinks 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 and finally he makes an attempt and he succeeds so that is the switch and a basal ganglia person if he is walking suddenly you stop him he will fall down because his motion is not that switch mechanism is not the turn off mechanism is not working so that is a turn off mechanism here is the thing you turn on mechanism you just see that uh, uh, the olympic runners they just are ready because they do not want to waste see look here if you are looking here how there is a lag of time with some individuals so that means uh, they use this uh, pedal uh, so that they will take it uh, as a propulsive uh, movement so that they can take on or turn on the entire event now turning off this is the end so now this end point uh, when they reach uh, they will stop but they cannot stop ab abruptly they have a motion still they have to continue for some time and some distance and then they will be stopping but in case of a danger they will stop in case of a danger if there is a, a valley in front of them they will stop that is a turning on and a turning off uh, uh, signals maintained by the basal ganglia well i have covered uh, the number of points about basal ganglia uh, to summarize the basal ganglia or a, a group of subcortical nuclei they are named as caudate putamen globus pallidus subthalamic nucleus and substantia nigra these are the five things there are other things they are connected in series with a premotor cortex basal ganglia thalamus motor cortex and motor neurons both axial posture regulating and distal they action there are what are called a direct pathway which are hyperkinetic which are excitatory the indirect pathway these are hypokinetic there is a fine adjustment performed by the another group of nucleus that is substantia nigra and intrastriatal neurons in the basal ganglia we have glutamate gaba dopamine acetylcholine as a neurotransmitter i have basically are primarily there are four neurotransmitters glutamate gaba dopamine acetylcholine glutamate is excitatory gaba is inhibitory dopamine plus and minus acetylcholine plus and minus the basal ganglia performs following actions planning programming and sequencing of actions execution of the motor pattern of activity performing cognitive control of an action cognitive control of an action because of the impending danger scaling of action depending upon the motion required the timing of actions the posture and associate movements for the action 
for any voluntary action, there are associate moments. Then there is an oscillation of the agonist and antagonist group of muscles. They are dampened. Then basal ganglia is a switch that is a turning on or a turning off the voluntary action. Yes, these are the summary. Now I will mention the assignments. The, see, look here. This is a very important topic. I have taken enough time to explain each one of these things. I can explain n number of times as, as long as you want because uh, this is um, in terms of the examination, this is one of the important topics. Describe the parts, connections, circuitry, and functions of basal ganglia. That is question number one. Or the question may be, describe the parts, the circuitry of basal ganglia. Mention the neurotransmitters from different connections or sites. Mention fine-tuning of the hyperkinetic and hypokinetic pathway. I have already explained. Then write short notes on striatum, globus pallidus, lentiform nucleus, nigrostriatal tract, direct circuit, indirect circuit, putamen circuit, cortex circuit. I have explained each one of them. Then uh, in the next class, I will take with again the physiological basis of uh, disorders of basal ganglia. I have referred the same books uh, that is uh, Genong, Guyton, and the Chandel's Book of Neuroscience, and the Samson Wright. Thank you all.